You know what? Let's go with the D4 because I know some of you guys want me to play D4. You want me to emphasize positional concepts. So I'm going to, you know, I can transpose into the modern, but we're going to play C4. We're going to forcefully play the King's Indian here. So E4, this is the, this will probably transpose to the King's Indian if he plays D6 and Knight F6. Now, a lot of people miss, you know, the difference between the King's Indian and the perk is, um, involves white playing different moves. So in the perk, white doesn't play the move C4. White just plays E4, D4, and usually knight to C3. In the King's Indian, white adds this move C4. And some of you guys might be like, well, why would anyone play the perk with white? This just grabs more space. But as I've talked about many times, it's a meme now, getting more space in the opening isn't necessarily a good thing. Yeah, so we've transposed into a King's Indian. Now, one of my favorite lines against the King's Indian, the one that I, I recommend to most of my students, is the Samish. Samish, named after, I think, Austrian Grandmaster Friedrich Samish. Uh, what move uh, leads to the Samish here? Yes, so F3. Now, never play F3. If you've never seen this move before, I know it looks weird. It's like, well, what are we doing here? Um, you know, why are we taking away this square from the knight? But there's more to it than that. And we, first of all, we build a little pawn chain. We defend the e4 pawn. And we create this little crevice, right? And you see this in many openings. And we put the bishop in that crevice. And then we're, in most lines, going to castle long here. And we are preparing a, kind of a Sicilian style pawn attack on the king's side. Um, and um, there are lines where white can still castle short here. F3 is not such a huge weakening of the king's side. Um, but most of the time, the same issue is one of the, is, is the only line against the king's Indian where white regularly castles long. Um, so it's an attempt to put the king's Indian out of commission. Now black, of course, has his own attacking chances. Okay, so E5 by Simon. Now the rule for dealing with the center when you've got um, a king side attack going, right? Do you want to open up the center when you're attacking on a flank or close it down? What's the general rule? Yeah, so generally you want to close it down. So we go d5. We, should, we don't have to rush with d5 actually, but that's the more, more conceptual move. Yes. And e5 is sort of the old main line. And our, our plan here is going to be to play... So we're going to play very straightforward chess. We play queen to d2, preparing to castle long. And then we are going to begin the king side attack h4, h5, g4, you know, bishop h6. All these moves are very standard in the king's Indian. And if black is not experienced in this line, he can get checkmated super quick. Because black has to know how to manufacture attacking chances on the queen side. And that's not easy to do because we've driven some pawns down his gut here. And already Simon is playing a little bit too slowly. This move rookie eight is it, it, it uh, he's preparing to bishop h8 against bishop h6 but he has bigger priorities he needs to start getting stuff done on the queen side how do we attack on the king side this is an art a lot of people just sort of close their eyes and kind of just g4 g4, g4 try slow down and try to determine what the priorities are now here's the thing if we start by playing h4 black has a way of slowing down the king side attack in a big way. How can black slow down in the attack if we play h4? h4 is not a mistake, but just want to kind of alert you guys to some of the subtleties here. Yes, black can play h5. And I know that there is a rule which says you can't push your pawns in front of your king. Well, that's not always the case. And the move h5 gives black a lot of time because it takes a while for white to play g4 and break that down. White can play g4 immediately and sack a bunch of pawns. That gets super sharp. I'll show you guys after the game. So that's the drawback of playing h4. Now, what move can we play in order to make h4 stronger? And I know a lot of you are thinking g4, but it's not, not what move other than g4 can we play? What non-pawn move can we play? Yes, so remember that one of the key components of this attack is the move bishop to h6, which is explained because we want to get rid of his fianchetto bishop. That is the main defender of his king. And he can drop the bishop back to h8. I assume that's why Simon moved the rook to it. It's a typical idea. But the secondary purpose of bishop h6 is to pave the way to hold black down in preparation for h4, h5. A lot of people play g4. g4 is not a bad move. But sometimes you can actually attack without even playing g4. 
Um, and the, and that you can just play h4, h5. Because remember once again, what is the point of a pawn storm? Point of a pawn storm is oftentimes just to open up files for your rooks, right? And it's not necessarily, and, and sometimes you actually want to sacrifice a pawn. You sometimes actually just want to give this pawn up, jettison it, so that this rook has an open h file, which it can attack on. So I'm not saying g4 is bad, but sometimes you can save time on g. If black skillfully plays the queen side, every tempo is valuable. Here, g4, we can probably just get away with. Yes, if h4, h5 are already played, I would, I would play. So Simon develops his bishop. Now, one very common mistake here is that people take on g7 too early. They think, yes, you know, I got a chance to get that bishop out of the way. But remember why you played bishop h6. Yes, trading the bishops is, good, is a good idea, but it's more important to prevent black from playing h5. Does that make sense? So if you take the bishop and then play h4, you've kind of, um, you've taken a step backward because black can play h5 and also black can move the rook into h8 if necessary, bringing another defender in. So let's go h4. All right. I mean, I, th I think that makes sense, right? Well, sometimes we can sack the rook, but only if you have queen g5 as a follow-up here, we don't necessarily have that. So let's see what Simon does. Now, we don't have to rush with h5. We, and if we have time, then g4 is a great idea because g4 um, makes sure that after h5, black can't take on h5. Um, so Simon, he hasn't created really any chances on the queen side for now, which basically means that, okay, so now he's starting to do something. He wants to play b5. Unfortunately for him, I think he might be a little bit too late. Now, here we need to weigh the pluses and minuses of playing h5 versus playing g4. So thank you, I appreciate that. So if we play h5, it'll take with a knight, and then we can take the, you know, we can try to go g4 to dislodge the knight. But if you calculate that, this is where calculation comes in. After, let, let's visualize, h5, knight takes h5, g4. Wh what very annoying square can that knight access in that position? Thank you, Fist of Eden. It's not just gonna obediently step back to f6, it's going to go to f4, very nice guys. And the reason that that is annoying is because our queen, the, the connection between white's queen and the key h6 square, which the queen wants to access, will be severed. And that's, you know, we can go to h2 there, but then that loses more time. So I think here, if we weigh the pros and cons, I think g4 is worth it. I think it's worth it to play g4 because when we now play h5, Black will not be able to take with the knight. Then we are going to open the h file on our own terms. Then we're going to take the bishop and slide our queen into h6. As you can see, it takes a little bit more time. And that's time Simon can use uh, to, to attack on the queen side. But as I've explained, he's I think he's delayed it long enough for us to afford something like this. Well, knight g2 is slower, right? Knight, knight g2 is possible. Yeah, knight g2 would be another great way to deal with this because it would cover the f4 square with the knight, but g4 is more thematic. It's sort of the prescribed method of doing it. And the knight actually sometimes goes out to h3 and g5 later, so it's a little bit more flexible. Yeah, Pepper I'll explain why not bishop takes anything, because that gives away a key attacker, right? If we don't miss the forest for the trees here, if you give up this bishop for a knight, then it leaves him with an uncontested dark squared bishop and white's attack kind of fizzles out and run. Well, and Simon going king h8, which, which, which is a good defensive move. I think he's trying to slide the knight back to g8 or bring the rook in. So he's sort of, you know, he's getting into curling up into a ball and hoping for the best. And I don't mean to talk about that disparagingly. It is a legitimate, legitimate defensive strategy. But it's, it's, you know, and it's hard to break down. So... Black's position is not as lost as you guys may think. It's, attacking is not when, you know, your opponent defends well. Attacking is not a race. It takes many stages. It takes time to really break down the defenses. Okay, but this doesn't influence our strategy. We still want to go h5 and open up the h file. There's nothing else that we can do. So let's go ahead and, and, and do that. Russ DT, thank you for the gift to Buster Boy. Yeah, so Simon might be going rook g8. This is a pretty decent defensive strategy. I don't think it's gonna work in the long term, but it's gonna stave off checkmate for quite a while, that's for sure. Um, so when you're defending on a broad level, you often have to choose between active defense and passive defense. And passive has a bad connotation, but it, 
doesn't really shouldn't in chess. Sometimes passive defense is what is required. Sometimes you just do have to curl up into a ball because whatever counterattack you may have is too slow. And I think this is the case here. I like his move. I think b5 would just, it would be too slow. He would have to open up the b belt. It would realistically take him five, six moves before he really created any chances, if that makes sense. Um, so, okay, so again, our moves are pretty much autopilot right now. We want to open up the H file. Nothing crazy there, right? We want to, we open up the H file. Now I'm assuming that he's going. Now G5 would be a, an instructive mistake because remember that would allow his knight to take on H5. So first order of business is to open up that H file. Myers noticed. Don't tell the crowd about that experience. Okay. FG. Now. I'm going to blow your guys' mind. I'm going to make a move here that people will be like, what? So this whole time, right, I've been talking about trading bishops. But you have to be, as I've talked about many times, very receptive to the circumstance and the way that they change. You can't be, you can't tunnel vision anything. You've got to be ready to change the way that you think about things. Um, and this is one of those cases. Now, this, how has the circumstance changed? Well, his king is now an h8. It's in the direct line of fire of the rook. What does that mean? Where do we want our queen ultimately? We can have it on h6. What other square could we move the queen to with the same intention? Yes, queen h And very, you guys are all saying it beautiful. So we drop the bishop to g5. Our plan is to go queen h2 and eliminate the defender of the h1. Right? So because he's driven his king into a corner, now we actually want the bishop for a different purpose than it was originally intended for. We don't care about his bishop anymore. That's no longer the main defender. The main defender is now his knight because it's protecting the h mono. That makes sense. So we drop the bishop back. Why don't we play queen h2 first? Because then he can actually take our bishop and that's actually bad for us and br bring his queen into f8. The queen, as I've discussed, is often best in the shadows on the sort of in the back of the attack because it's very vulnerable when it's right in the king's face. It can be strong, but it can also be susceptible to attack. And when it's on h2, it's it's just as beastly as it is on h6, and it's much less vulnerable. So b4, I thought about it, but he has got knight a4. That's actually a great question, and we should definitely look at both sides of the board. Uh, but knight a4 does save the knight, and it would weaken our queen side. Well, queen e7, we have a beautiful move there. I hope he plays queen e7. Then we have a we have a gorgeous, gorgeous sac uh, idea. Yeah, bishop f8. I mean, all of these moves stave off checkmate. And you have to be... Well, moving knight to h5 would remember that his knight is pinned to the queen. You know, if you're not finding checkmate, that not, that's not because you did something wrong. You've got to be very patient when you're attacking. As I've said before, um, if your opponent defends well, you have to accumulate the pieces and... You know, as I said, many times over, um, you know, at one stage of attack, another one, keep nurturing stuff. So here, for example, what move should we play? Just to follow up on the previous move. Yeah, queen h2. If we take first, that would be too early because he would take back. And then queen h2 would threaten checkmate, but it would easily, but it would just, it would be easily defended against, and then we would lose our bishop. Yeah. So Simon, kudos to him, he's defending very, very well, given the circumstances. And I'm glad I'm, I'm getting a chance to display. Okay, so this is a great time to practice patience. Now, there's no checkmate here. We can take the knight. That would be a horrible idea because we'd just be giving up the bishop. And we need to find, you know, as I like to say, we need to add some Tabasco sauce to the attack. And what Tabasco sauce means is more pieces. <laughs> Now, which pieces, and to add more pieces, we'll need to be patient. We can't bring the knight to h6 in one move. Now, we can use two different pieces come to mind. We can use our rook. Now, could somebody propose a plan that involves activating the rook and putting it on the right square? And this is not, I, I don't think this is what we're going to play. Yeah, rook to d2, then moving the queen, and then bringing the rook to h2. It's not the ideal Alakine's gun, but it's the best that we can do. Do. Um, so let me think about this for a second. I actually have a really five-head idea, but I'm not sure. I, I actually am honestly not sure if it's worth it. Hmm. 
No, it's not worth it. No, 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 it's too risky. Okay, so that's one idea. That's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go rook to d2. Uh, but then maybe knight takes g4 is a nasty attack. So let's let's begin. Let's begin by playing queen h4 and increasing the, the pressure on the knight. And uh, he's gonna have to go bishop to e7 here. And then we're gonna go rook to two, rook h2. I'll show you, yep, exactly. Just a boxing cage. You deserve. If you were to sub, I would personally gift you one. You you guessed that idea, but there is actually a problem here, guys. And he is defending very well. Now the bishop on g5, it's sort of indirectly attacked by two pieces. So, um, what does anybody see? What black is threatening here? Kind of a. And I've talked about this idea before. The knight can move. It can take on d5, and if we take the knight, then he wins our queen by taking the bishop. And if he takes the bishop, then that same knight takes. I showed this to Charlie, actually. So we actually need to defend the bishop. Do we have a way to defend the bishop? Without sort of moving it or, or doing anything horribly on that h3. Now, I know some of you are thinking, but doesn't this block the h file, right? Isn't this counterproductive? It does. But we're playing the long game here. We'll unblock the h file. It's fine. That's just one more tempo. And black doesn't have anything going on the queen side. Um, so this is a good example of being patient and receptive to the twists and turns of the attack. Um, and I actually miss knight takes d5, but that doesn't mean we need to we need to go crazy or lose our mind. So now we're going to go rook d2 according to plan. We're not distracted by a move like bishop h6, which would open up. I know some of you are thinking that, but this would open up the x-ray against the queen. Knight takes d5 would become possible. He might even sack an exchange there. We're not looking for an exchange. We're ultimately going for a bigger prize. So we're playing methodically. We're, we're slowly bringing all of the pieces into the attack, and we're looking to break down his defenses ultimately. Thank you, Gigahertz and Fuko Dirida, gifting to Protected Pawn and Grobster Master, and QK Q, K Mine, gift, getting subs as well. Thank you, folks. Thank you much. Okay, so knight g8. If we break down this move, this attacks f3. It doesn't attack our bishop. In fact, we want him to take our bishop because we'll capture with the knight, bring the knight into the attack. Gigahertz another to Nassau Lies. And in fact, speaking of knight to g5, we have a very nice, how should I call it, a restructuring of our pieces. What can we do? What, what does that mean? We have a nice way to re, rejigger sort of our, our attackers here in order to include everything and unblock the h file. And you should always look for this kind of stuff. Yeah, let's take the bishop. And then we play knight h5, knight g5, knight g5. You see what I'm saying? Stuff like that you have to consider. Um, stuff like that you have to consider, capture, and then replace the knight with the bishop. Thomas Wilson Barnes, another sub, thank you for the three months. Yeah, rejigger just means rearrange. Okay, knight g5. And are we threatening anything, guys? Are we threatening anything? Tactical eyes. We are threatening checkmate, queen h7 and rook h7. We might not even need the third rook, but we have it in reserve if we need it. So step by step, paint it long, but methodical. We are breaking down his defenses. And we might force the h-pawn to move. That would create another weakness. Yeah, Simon is defended, and that's another great move. Now, rook h2 here would be not that effective because this is defended by this knight as a hero. So what I'm thinking of, and this is where I might not be very good at explaining this, but we have to look at both sides of the board. And somebody earlier mentioned this move, B4. We're gonna play this move now, and I'm gonna show you guys why. This doesn't trap the knight as I explained. The knight actually has only one square, but this is leading up to something. This is leading up to something. And what this is leading up to, well, what? how does the position change as a result of this trade? What can we now do? The bishop is out of the way. What does this free up? It frees up 96, right? Um, it frees up 96, but after 96, we have to reckon with queen takes f3. And yet I'm gonna sacrifice that pawn. I'm gonna sacrifice that pawn because this is a massive square for the knight. I think it's going to pay off. No, I mean, he had no choice. That was the only square for the knight that he could go to. 
I'm still lilting the Southern Knight. Okay, he decides to sack the exchange. That might be the best thing that he can do. But now we have to be super careful. So I'm playing brilliantly here. Uh, because the queen wants to swing. That's the drawback of playing before. We're weakening our king. So what move should we make? Now we have to make a defensive move ourselves. The rook is not hanging. No, no. He said king b2 is fine. But what about bishop d3 getting the bishop out? And locking down the queen. Locking down the queen. Rook d3 would be a bit awkward. And we have a chance to develop our bishop here. Well, rook d3 wouldn't develop the bishop, and, and it would violate the rule of pieces of value, right? It would put a lower value piece um, to in charge of something, higher value piece, rather, in charge of something. And he's low on time here. That's another byproduct of defending for this long, right? Queen back. Now this rook, we used to want to put it on h2, but now we're going to put it on f2 so it can infiltrate to f7. Flexibility above everything. That will trap the queen and win the game. So the attack concludes successfully. It was only 28 moves. It looked like 50 moves. It was so intense. There's so much happening. Um, but, oh, g5, that's a great defensive move. But where should we put our queen? Where should we put our queen? Yeah, we should slide it into h5 in order to prevent the queen from moving his Knight f6 is a great try, but it's not going to work. If we take the queen, he takes, but we're going to play queen takes h6 check, and this wins rook h6. We're going to take the knight, and this is going to be checkmate forthcoming. Yeah. This is very nice. Another pawn. I mean, this is, I'm not explaining this. This is easy. We just take everything. Okay. 200 bits. Thank you. Yeah. Amazing game, Simon. You, uh, you're the man. That was fantastic defense. I think you actually had chances up until the very end. We'll wrap up after the explanation. Now, there's a lot I could talk about here. I don't want to over-explain. Now, black's main move here is actually c6. That's black's main move because what c6 aims to do, and I used to play this line. This is the old main line. The bottom line here without, you know, I don't want to talk too much about theory is that we open up the queen side a little bit. And right, we open up the C file and we prepare B5 quickly. So the point is black very quickly starts his own counter attack. And then you get a super sharp position. I've played a couple of games in this line. White attacks on the king side, black attacks on the queen side. And it's um, it's just pandemonium. So knight BD7 is a very King's indian -y move. That's why the Samish is good. The standard King's Indian ideas often aren't as effective in the Samish because it's an unconventional way of playing. So queen d2, preparing to castle, rook e8. And here I would still maybe consider going c6, although here you might be dropping that pawn. Um, so yeah, knight bd7 is, is actually a mistake. And here you started playing phenomenally, Simon. So bishop h6, right? Um, h4 allows h5, which is not something that we want. And now we go h4. We go g4. So once again, if we go h5 here and we take, a lot of people like this kind of concept and it would be made if we could go queen g5 but we can't because the queen defends that square uh so and once again if we go g4 then the knight slides into f4 some of you guys asked well what why can't we just take but you're missing the forest for the trees white's white is no attack anymore and the bishop is uncontested right and you know this is actually just very very bad for white paddle bro thank you for the three months yeah so i would have played maybe b5 b5 right away is a thought but Maybe something like this, Banco Gambit style. But now white has b4. <laughs> Don't be afraid to push your pawns in front of your king sometimes. The knight, ooh, and look at this position. The knight is just trapped. So the accuracies, sure. I mean, I think my accuracy might have been low. I made, some in I made quite a few inaccuracies probably there in the attack. 91.1 for me and 68 for Simon. But obviously that's, it doesn't tell much of the story at all. In a, in a game like this, you know, the computer always finds improvements. Attacking games often feature a lot of inaccuracies, but this, I don't, you know, that's why I don't like checking the accuracy because it, it belies the actual, the actual strength, right? Okay, so G4. Um, and that's why we, we prepare H5. Can you explain the five head move? Yes, that'll be a little bit later. King H8, H5. Now this I'm going through quickly because 
We are just uh, doing what I said we would do. And bishop to g5, right? So we are now... Yeah, so could black have tried takes, takes, and knight g8? Yes. Oh, and then g5 to lock things down. That would have been a very pretty five-head defense. That actually would... Oh, that was actually a really interesting defense. And things are locked up on the queen's end. Now, that doesn't mean white is worse here. Because now we can try to slide the knight into f5 and stuff. But that would have been a really cool defensive idea. Um, so you see, you can be very creative when you're defending. Uh, some people like defending for that reason. But rook g8 is understandable. Okay, so bishop to g5, preparing queen h2. Now we're threatening to take rook g7. This is a very nice idea, Simon. Restructuring. Now look at that, just professional stuff. Now, bishop h6 to kick the rook blocks the h-file, and it opens up the x-ray. So we'll black and maybe... Well, he can't take because bishop takes his check, but he can move the rook. Um, so knight h3 to defend the bishop. Okay, so bishop h6 here. There is knight takes d5. Um, and and this, this, this leads to complete pandemonium. He attacks the queen. He's going to ruin our pawn structure. So again, when you are attacking, you have to be very... How should I put it? Um, you have to be very discerning when it comes to bailing out, cashing out. It's like you won the lottery. So as you're driving, you know someone flags you down and I've made this analogy before and it's like, well, why don't you give me, you know, a hundred bucks? I'll give you a hundred bucks right now in cash, right now, here it is. But you just give me that little piece of paper, you got that little ticket, ah, sure. Now, if someone offers you, you know, a million dollars in cash, yeah, maybe you'll consider it, but, um, but, but, but that's kind of like trading your attack in for winning a rook versus trading your attack in for winning an exchange. Kipoga, Kipoga language right there. So rook d2, bringing in the rook, reshuffling, getting the knight involved. We're threatening queen takes h7, which would be checkmate. And now b4, attacking the knight. Now the, the five head move that I had in mind, guys, the five head move that I had in mind was actually b4. And after knight a4, we're trying to build Alakine's gun. We're trying to get this rook over to h3. Um, but I was a little bit worried about this, first of all, because it does weaken the king. And as I now realize, I, it was a false alarm. Black has a really cool tactical idea here. Who can tell me what it is? Was 20, I think, for the sub? Yeah, knight g4 is classic because the bishop is hanging. And takes, takes is fine for black, but we have queen h4. See, this is, this is e even... I miss these kinds of moves because it defends defends the bishop and attacks a hard move to see. Um, so probably we should have done this, then gone f4 and rook to h3. But I figured it's a little bit less risky to just play more conventionally. Now we go b4, opening up the e6 square uh, for the knight. And actually, Simon, I think after queen f3, bishop d3. Thank you, Foxtrot and the Undead Mariner for the tier one love. Loving the sport, guys. Thank you. I think black is under tremendous strain here, but I actually don't see what the follow-up is for white. Like, queen sack is not made. I, you know, white's position looks super impressive, but I'm not sure black is worse here. Uh, but, but the pressure is immense, and, and I totally get the impulse to, you know, to give up an exchange, but I just don't think you've got enough here. And this pawn is such a strong pawn. And at this point, I mean, I think black has just lost to get the rook, and g5 was a great move. But you just don't have enough here. It's just not enough, uh, not enough material. Yeah, you definitely, I think, would have would have probably taken an F3 if you had a little bit more time. So we'll play 15 minutes next time, Simon. But that was a phenomenal defensive effort. That is how you defend. You resist every move. You bring pieces in. You don't panic. And uh, you defend threat by threat. But that is a good, I think, illustration of the common attacking ideas in the same-ish. Um, and... Uh, you know, this was a very, very hotly contested game. It was like 28 moves, but um, it felt like so much longer. 200 bits from SBW. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Have a great weekend, and I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.